gathering her stuff. I see Johnny drag gathering hers. I see Kay gathering hers. Okay. Oh, Tina, you're staying with us today? Well, praise God. Thank you for the blessings, right, Tina? I so appreciate the ladies that take care of the children's church and nursery. And um, we uh, we actually added a new worker this week that uh, went through the background check and everything that will be working with Tina when she goes back there. So that's exciting. And uh, we can always use more help. Thank you. <laughs> I'm getting nervous. Um, so if you would be interested in helping with that, uh, just it, it can be just once a once a month, once every other month. The more volunteers we have, the less often you have to do it. Um, but it can be a blessing to you, and it definitely is a blessing to moms and dads. Amen. My goodness, it's like, it's like y'all went to the Chiefs game last night or something. Oh, it wore you out, huh? Okay. All right. Well, I have uh, been looking forward to today for a couple months now since I messaged Greg and asked him if he would come and share with us. Um, Probably best connection for me that I remember with Greg and I was a couple years ago at um, Ministers Renewal, which is a, like a retreat for ministers. And um, the the speaker uh, at the end of the message asked for any pastors who had children who were not serving the Lord if they would come forward and let let him pray for us. And of all of the pastors there, there were a few hundred people there. About a third of the pastors got up and walked forward, and it was, I mean, everybody was just shocked. I mean, I don't think we realized. And um, and so after he prayed for us, he encouraged us to connect with somebody and, and to share, you know, about our child and then to pray. And we connected with Greg and I. And um, I, I tell you... Um, when you have a child, some of you already know this, that's not serving the Lord, it weighs heavy on you. Especially if they were raised in a Christian home and, you know, all the other kids followed the Lord and went the right way and then you have the, the one. And uh, you still love them and you still, uh, you know, want to bless them and you still want to do all that you can to, to lead them to a place of where they'll know the Lord and serve Him. Um, but sometimes... Uh, those kids are more receptive to somebody other than mom and dad. And so to have somebody, uh, there are several people in this church right now I know that reach out to my son and and, uh, and have an impact in his life, and, and you're making a difference. We're seeing some change in his life, and so he's not looking for the Lord yet, but we anticipate that coming very, very soon, him coming back to, to the Lord. But anyway, that was our connection with them, and uh, so I'm always... Uh, since that moment, really just kind of held them in high esteem and appreciate uh, their willingness to pray for my son. And uh, so I'm looking forward to having Greg share with us. He shared a little bit of the scripture that he's going to use today in the title of the message, so that got me fired up. I'm ready to, to hear what he has to say. So will you, I'll let him kind of give the details of who he is and what he does and all that stuff. Will you welcome Greg Perkins as he comes and speaks to the Lord? Well, it's exciting to be here this morning. Thank you for the opportunity. Pastor Carl and Margo, thank you so much for your hospitality and your friendship. Uh, very excited about what's happening here in Humansville and here at Life Church. Uh, I love following along, stalking you guys on Facebook and, and, uh, and hearing, hearing the testimonies. Pastor Carl came, uh, it's been about a year ago, came up to Kansas City with us for uh, a rural compassion event um, where we were doing a, a pastor's training and Pastor Carl came and, and just shared how uh, that impact of rural compassion has has impacted uh, Humansville and, and built so many great relationships uh, between your leadership and the city and, and your church in the city and, and that's what it's all about is, is leveraging those relationships for the cause of Christ and so I've been uh, very very much looking forward to this as well. Um, and so I, uh, I serve as the church development director, which sounds like I raise money, but that's not what I do. Um, I, I'm, I'm more of a church health guy. Um, and so I work with churches to help stimulate church health. And I work with churches that are struggling, churches that maybe are, are nearing the point of closure and, and, and trying to come alongside them and help them with some strategy to, to, to kind of change that around. Uh, 
we try to change hearts and minds in the process, and sometimes that becomes a, a, a bit of a difficulty. Uh, but I, I absolutely love the opportunity that I have to, to speak into the life of leaders and to churches and working with church boards, and, and uh, so I'm very, very grateful for that opportunity. The other hat that I wear for Southern Missouri District is the district men's director, and in just about a month and a half, we'll be gathering for our 36th men's gathering. We're calling it Men's Summit at, uh, at uh, Crown, uh, what, what do they call that? Cross Point. Cross Point Camp. It used to be just the camp, and that's <laughs> it, it sticks in my head. Uh, but we meet at the campground every year and, and have done for the last 35 years. And so for the 36th time, men will gather at the campground uh, for a, a two-day retreat. And it is a powerful, powerful experience. Last year, we had 550 men that gathered, worshiping the Lord, being challenged in their walk with God, building relationships with other guys, tossing logs, throwing tomahawks, uh, you know, swapping knives. It's it's really kind of a, a, a really uh, cool thing. I um, I happen to be on the wrong end of the tomahawk throw, uh, but we won't get into that. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, but it's it's a great, great time. There's still time to uh, to get involved with that. Go to the uh, to our solomen.com, our website, and you can register through that. It's a great opportunity. Uh, my wife, Diane, doesn't always get to travel with me, but uh, we're fairly close to home, and my wife, Diane, just waved. I won't, I've, I've learned very uh, very quickly never to put her on the spot to ask her to come forward or to say something or to sing or, you know, play the piano. She looks great at conventions, and she looks, uh, but anyway, I won't, uh, I won't do that to her because uh, I, uh, I love my life. <laughs> And I love my life. So uh, just uh, really excited to be with you. I won't take any more time to, uh, uh, to tell you any more about us. But we do have two grown sons, um, one of which is married, uh, living in Kansas City. And uh, we have our oldest son, who is a uh, literally a traveling consultant. Uh, and uh, he uh, is a business strategy consultant with, uh, with lots of companies. and Helps them walk through strategy and product and innovation and, and all of those kinds of things. So it's really, really fun to see our boys uh, growing up and, and doing the things that they're passionate about. Isn't that always really cool when your kids can chase their dreams? And uh, so, again, privileged to be with you today. I want you to turn in your Bibles or your electronic device, whatever you use, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll get there in just a moment. But I want to challenge you by making a bold statement right here at the very beginning of my message this morning. And this may short circuit some of you. Um, I, I won't take a show of hands, but every church has a few churches, right? Uh, people who've been around church a long time and maybe are a little more traditional, a little bit more um, straight laced and whatever. This statement may throw you for a loop. So I'm just going to give you notice to be prepared for this because what I'm about to say is going to sound very counterproductive to what we're doing this morning. Okay. And here it is. We are not called to go to church. Nowhere in Scripture does it tell us. Now, before everybody completely panics, let me give you the background of this, uh, because sometimes that, that's a shocking statement to hear. We're not called to go to church. What do you mean we're not called to church? We're, we're here. Well, let me just say, I'm thankful that you are here. I know Pastor Carl and Margo are thankful that you are here this morning, and we are always excited when the church gathers together. But we are not called just to go to church. I do believe, however, that God did call us to be the church. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, being the church. Now, it may sound like there's not much of a difference between the two, but it is a very different statement. We are not called to go to church. We are called to be the church. Because, see, most of us, that's a foreign concept because... Because we behave like church is somewhere that we go on Sundays. Or, or, or that it's something that we belong to as a matter of identity. But that isn't what the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches something very different. You see, I believe that the church is not where we've been called to go or a thing that we do. The church is who we are called to be in this world. And I'm not just playing word games with you. I believe that the word that God has for this place is not a word for a building. It's not a, 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 a word for a, a, a collection of furniture. It's a, it's, a, it's a word for a collection of 
people. Okay? And the word is this. The church is not a building or a place. The church is a people. The church is a people. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit inspired writers as they as they wrote the word of God, the New Testament, what we now have, have is the New Testament. And they used a single Greek word that we translate church, ekklesia. And Strong's Concordance defines this word as an assembly, a congregation, a church. The church, the whole body of Christian believers. And in total, this word church was used 114 times in the New Testament which is pretty pretty amazing. If you see something's repeated more than once, that means it's important. You see it repeated 114 times. Obviously, it's something very important to the heart of God. And ecclesia is comprised of two Greek words, the first being ek, E-K, which means out from and to. And then the word kaleo, which means to call. So in other words, the word literally means the called out. Or when applied specifically to Christ's church, the called out to the world and to Jesus. That's who we are. That's who we've been called to be. So this morning, I want, I want us to look at what it means to be the church. What does it look like to be the church from two different angles? And so I want us to look at the form of church or the shape of church. And then I want us to look at the function of of church or the behavior. Okay? You ready? Lock in. We're gonna look at it from the angle of the form, the shape of church. What does what shape does the church take that we can see in these modern times? We obviously were use the word church to refer to an organization, and that's not inappropriate. The church is an organization. Okay? That means that we have structure, that we most times have a building or a facility that we meet. We have a collection of, of beliefs that help everybody move in the same direction. But that isn't all that the church is. It's more than that. The church is also, more accurately, an organism. A living, breathing body of believers that are connected to each other, just like a physical body. And in the same way, the body serves and helps other parts, or the church serves one another. The body fits together and functions by following the leadership of the head of the body, who is Christ. And God's Word teaches and describes to us that the church is His body, or the body of Christ. So look with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We see this, this church existing and functioning as the body of Christ. And, and this passage gives us a picture of that. In verse 12, of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says, Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, there's a lot of scripture that comes right after that, but I want you to look down to verse 27, because this brings it all together. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. So the form of the church is the body of Christ. That's the shape of the church in the earth today. And the best form or shape that we have is this this body. I mean, I think it gives it a gives us a really good mental picture of how the church is put together. But, but listen to the, maybe this way to describe it. The church is the representation or the physical embodiment of Christ in the earth. As the body of Christ, we are his representative here on the earth, in our community, at our jobs, Everywhere that we find ourselves, whether it's at the AG, IGA grocery store or, or, or the Walmart or any of the other places that we find ourselves, we are the representation of Christ in that place. Because this is not the church. You are the church. 
collectively we make up the body of Christ and we function as Christ in the world. Which leads us to the other angle of looking at the church. Say, wow, he's already on a second point. He said he had two points, form and function. He's already on a second point. He must be done. Nope. <laughs> I don't want to give you any false hope. I, I, I mean, we'll get done. And, and my goal is to be done about 10 minutes before you quit listening. Um, so, so we'll hopefully get there at the same point. But, but let's look at the function of the church. This is where everything starts to come together. So listen to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, verse 11 through 16. It says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up to become in every aspect or in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom, from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does that's the purpose of the church, to be the body of Christ. Christ is the head of the church. It's the head of the body. And the reason that we exist, Christ is the only reason that we exist. Connecting into the head and connecting to others to Christ by becoming part of his body is what being the church is all about. So, so we're responsible as the body of Christ to go and to reach others to help them become also part of the body of Christ. And by introducing new cells into the body, the body is rejuvenated and, keep, and, and, and kept young and vibrant. That's what we're here to do. That's, that's why we exist. Now, let me just interject this thought here. And this is also going to sound like a bold statement, and I don't, I don't say it to be mean, but if Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, then you are not the church. The only way that you become part of the church, it's not by signing a membership card. It's not even by, by giving in the offering. And let me tell you, both of those things are really important. They're significant. But that's not what makes you part of the body of Christ. Jesus, as your Lord and Savior, making him the head of your life, then makes you part of the body of Christ. And that is non-negotiable. So if you find yourself and you, you realize, well, I, I, don't, I don't have Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of my life. I don't have him as the head of my life. Then hang with me here for a minute, because in just a couple of moments, I'm going to tell you how to fix that. Right? But the question you have to ask yourself is, is Jesus your Messiah? Or is he just the friend that you can call on when you're in trouble? Is Jesus your Redeemer, the one who rescued, delivered, and set you free from the things that kept you as a slave to sin? Or is he the one that you fit into your schedule when it's convenient, or doesn't require too much of you. Because if he's your redeemer, then you can make him your Lord. But if he's just the one that you call on when you're in trouble, if he's just the one that, that you fit in when it's convenient, then he's not your Savior. He's not your Messiah. Christ is not an add-on. He is not your convenient, hey, could you do me a quick, quick favor kind of Savior. He wants to be your full-time Messiah. And that means that you can't just follow him on the days when it fits you. And if that describes you this morning, there's a remedy for that. And it's complete and total surrender to Jesus Christ and making him the Lord and Savior of your life. Plain and simple. 
And I'll tell you how to do that here in just a minute. You see, without Christ, we have no hope. We have no freedom. Without Christ, we have no church. Without Christ, we not only are, excuse me, with Christ, we not only have hope and freedom, and we don't merely just have a church, we are the church because of Christ. Because of Christ. So the last line of that text from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, you remember it? Did you catch it? As each part does its work. That means that we've got work to do. Every part of the body has a function. My fingers are what I use to pick up things. My eyes are the things that I use to signal my brain to tell the fingers where to pick up said item. They work in tandem. All of these things working together. There are times when I'm a little less coordinated, co coordinated than others. I'll, I'll just be honest with you. Sometimes when, when I do uh, uh, construction projects, I hit the wrong nail. Right? I, I don't hit the one that I'm intending. I hit the one that's attached to the end of my finger. And, and so my body immediately knows what to do in response. This hand immediately lectures this hand. You are a stupid finger. How did you get in the way? Right? No. No, that's not what happens at all. Because the body functions the way it functions, when this part hurts, this hand comes to its aid. You poor thumb. That nasty hammer jumped and got you. We'll take care of you. Here, let me get this blood. Am I right? The body functions. The body works. The body has a job to do. When, when, when foreign substances enter my body or a, a germ or some sort of bacteria, I have cells that are equipped to go and fight those cells. And when they don't fight those cells, we end up with problems, right? Isn't that much like the body of Christ? If every part does its job, then everything functions and everybody's healthy and everything's going great. But when one part decides, I don't want to do that. Can't make me. Don't want to. I don't want to do that. But you're the nose. You have to smell. Doesn't mean you have to stink. It means you have to smell, right? See, the body becomes broken <laughs> And dysfunctional when parts of it stop working. When things begin to shut down and body parts say, mm, I'm done. I don't want to play anymore. Now, there's a few of them that if they quit, you immediately know. Right? If the heart just says, you know what? I think I'm taking the day off. Guess what? The whole body's taking the day off. And probably the next forever off. Right? And there are key members within a body of believers, right? When they say, eh, I don't want it anymore. It impacts other parts of the body very quickly. And the analogies here could go on forever, but you get my point. The body has work to do. And one of the main functions of the body is maintaining the body and making sure that everything's working okay so that we can reach others and bring them in to the body. Because without new cells being created and being generated within the body, the body ultimately decays and dies. They say one of the most effective means of evangelism in the church today is a new church plant. Because what happens as the body of believers who are in a particular church or gathering, as they get older, they stop reaching out. They stop adding new cells. Ultimately, that body dies. Right? When a new church plant occurs, 
they're all about reaching new people. They're that that's their that's it. That's the only way they can survive and, and grow, right? When a church becomes quote unquote too mature to reach out, too mature to add new people, it's a sign of death. Death will come. It's just a matter of time. Friend, I don't believe that a new church plant is the only way to, to, to conduct evangelism. I believe that a body that is thriving, I don't care if you're 50 years old or 100 years old, I know some people, we, we had some neighbors uh, back when we lived in Osage Beach, uh, we had some neighbors across the street from us that were 90 and 92. And we, we would go and sit on the front porch with them and just tell stories. They were, they were some of the sharpest, People. I mean, just incredibly fun to hang around. There was so much life in them, friend. I don't care what your age is. Age is not even the discussion. It's your mindset that makes a difference. They didn't view themselves as old. They were up on all the latest technology and lingo. I mean, they're using their smartphones and all the other stuff. And, and I, had an, I had an app one night. We were talking about this particular app on my phone, and they wanted the app. 90 and 92. you giving me, I, I, I mean, it's like, you this, you got to be kidding me. Age is just a mindset. And a church that has a mindset to reach the lost will always be a healthy, vibrant church. But when we lose that mentality, we can no longer stay Turn with me to one final passage this morning. Now there's hope. But I just have seven remaining points. <laughs> I'm not kidding, actually, but it'll be quick. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. When we talk about the function of the church, probably the best example for us is the first century church. When we see the first century church in action... They were not perfect. Let me just put that out there. They were not perfect because they were made up of imperfect people. Right? And imperfect people, when acting in the flesh, can be just as stupid and arrogant and rude and obnoxious as somebody who, who doesn't even know Christ. Right? So we have to be careful as parts of the body of Christ that we are functioning by the leading of the Holy Spirit to do this. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. But, but in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, it gives us a picture of how the church functioned in the first century. And it's pretty amazing. Because we need to, to kind of compare ourselves, the things that our church does, to that template, because that template worked. <clears throat> and it is the best picture of the body of Christ in action that I think we can find. The book of Acts, we call it the book of Acts, or the Acts of the Apostles, or the Acts of the Church. I think it could just as easily be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit, or the function or works of the church. Or this is how the church ought to function. I don't know, chapter. I, I, don't, I don't know what. But Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47 says this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. Had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, very quickly, we just saw and read about the biblical function of a church body. Because that's how a church functions in the earth. And if our church doesn't function like this church, can we call ourselves? I mean, we might be a great civic organization. 
we might be a great club, but unless we're doing these things, are we truly a church? What are these? Let me just let me just summarize these with the last seven points. And if you've got something to write with, this is a good point for you to, to just write down. Seven of them. Reaching, connecting, worshiping, growing, serving, yielding, and giving. I'll give you those again. A church that functions as the body of Christ is reaching. That's evangelism. Reaching the lost. Going to where they are, not expecting them to come into our doors, but going to where they are, getting involved with their lives and building authentic relationships with them will reach them for Christ. It's about evangelism. Connecting. Connecting is the fellowship. Did you see where the church, when they gathered together, they were, they were functioning like that? They were connecting. They ate meals together. They spent time together. They hung out with each other. They connected with each other. And they made sure that other people were connecting as well. Right? So many of you came and greeted my wife and I as we came in. That was exciting. I, I show up at some churches and, and people just kind of brush on past. They're like, <laughs> and somebody in very like, the one that's going to speak today. <laughs> but they still don't come over and say hi. You guys were all friendly. But that's what you're that's what you're intending to do, right? You're you're intending to connect other people. Some of you are connectors. So when you meet someone, you say, "Oh, have you met so and so? Come here, let me take you and introduce you to so and so." It's about reaching the lost. It's about connecting with people. It's about worshiping God. It's about worshiping God. It's about growing. A church, a body of Christ, ought to be committed to growing in their maturity in Christ and helping others to do the same. It's discipleship. We're not serving. I love what, what Pastor Carl was saying. There, there's yet another opportunity for you to serve. Don't ever think that there's not going to be an opportunity. As long as Pastor Carl is your, is your pastor, I know with 100% certainty that he's going to have yet another thing for this church to rally around and do. Because that's what we do. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We never reach a point where it's like, well, I think we're good. <laughs> We've got just the right amount of people. We don't have any real problems. Yeah, I think we're good. Can I just tell you, I don't think your pastor is ever going to utter that phrase. <laughs> Nor should he. In fact, if he does, somebody call me and I'll come have a talk with him. Because something bad wrong has happened. We ought to be serving. Because Christ served. He's the head of the church. He's our example. He served. We ought to also serve. We need to give. Not just, not just in the Sunday offering, but we need to be giving of ourselves every single day. We need a spirit of generosity as individuals, as people within the body of Christ, because that's what the body of Christ is. It's generous. Somebody had need? Oh, well, hey, I got, I got this. I can help you with that. Oh, you, you need that? I, you know what? I know somebody who has one of those. Sometimes it's as simple as, maybe it's maybe not, maybe not God's not calling you to give up what you have to give to them, but maybe he's calling you or giving you a, a thought or an idea to connect them with someone who does have that. Oh, you know what? I just saw on Facebook Marketplace today that, they, that somebody was selling that for like 10 bucks. Really? Where can I find it? Do you realize that that's, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of evangelism right there? Somebody that finds something they're really excited about and then they become an evangelist for it to tell someone else about it? You find a good deal, you want somebody else in on the deal, you're like, hey, you should go over there because I just found something really amazing. Over there. Oh, and they got these three for a dollar. Right? You become an evangelist for whatever that is. That's also how we can give. That's how we can be generous. 
and then yielding, being led and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We were not called out just to go to church. We were not called out just to do Sunday morning stuff. We were and are called out to be the church, which means that we function like the church. We are called to be the church in human form. We are called to be the church at our office, at your school, at the grocery store, and specifically at Walmart. We need some church at Walmart. Even excluding the, 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 the current situation, people need Jesus. And the best way to do that is to be the church wherever you are. Be the church wherever you are. So what does all of this mean? As followers of Christ, we are the church. We are his body here on the earth. Christ wants and needs us to function that way here on the earth and specifically in our community. But Christ doesn't want to be an add-on. He wants to be your full foundation. He wants to be the one you fully built your life upon. And for those of you who are not followers of Christ, you said maybe to yourself earlier, I, I need that. I, I, Christ is not the head of my life. That means I'm not part of the body. I'm not part of the church. Let's fix that right now. Admit that you're a sinner and you cannot do this on your own. Believe that Jesus Christ is the one who died for you and he's the son of God. And confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord from this day forward. That's what it takes. ABC. Admit, believe, and confess. And you are then part of the body of Christ. Jesus Christ is the head of your life, which makes you part of this body and the greater body of Jesus Christ. The church on the earth. So I want you to just bow your heads with me real quick. If you're here this morning and say, Greg, Jesus is not the Lord and Savior of my life prior to this moment, but I want to change that, and I want to receive him into my life. I admit that I'm a sinner, and I cannot do this on my own anymore. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He died for me to make me clean and free. And I confess with my mouth in this moment, Jesus Christ is my Lord. And I will continue to confess that from this day forward. If that's you, lift your hand up. I want to pray with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus Christ is my Lord from this moment forward. Father, you've seen the hands that have been lifted here this morning. You hear the hearts cry. You hear what they're saying in their heart. They're admitting they cannot do this on their own. They're a sinner, and they can't do this on their own. They believe that you are the Son of God and that you died to make them free. And they are confessing in this moment and for the moments to follow that you are their Lord. Therefore, they are now part of the body of Christ. Hallelujah! 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 If you're here and you're part of the body of Christ, clap your hands because God has just transformed another life. Hallelujah. 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 Now here's the other challenge I want to give you. If you are a follower of Christ, you've decided, you've made that, that, that declaration, he is the foundation of your life, you are part of the body. But has he become an adult? Has he become just one of the other things in your life? Friend, I'm going to challenge you and the others sitting next to you. That if you're ready to be the church in your community, to be the church when you go to the office, when you go to the, the, the assembly line, when you get in the car to go wherever you're going, when you go to school, you go to the grocery store, if you're committed to be the church in Humansville and wherever you go, I want you to stand to your feet right now. I am part of the church. I am the body of Christ in my community. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now just stretch your hands toward heaven. Ask him for the strength to be his church. In the name of Jesus, 
In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, you know us. You know our weaknesses. You know where we fail. You know all of our strengths and our weaknesses. But God, you have chosen us anyway. You called us out to be your church. And I pray, God, that you would give us strength to be your representative in this community, to be your representative in the school, to be your representative at a, at a city council meeting, to be your representative at a, in our homes and in, 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 in the, 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 the grocery store and the, the, the thrift store and wherever else we find ourselves. Father, in the name of Jesus, raise up a mighty body in this city that will transform this Lord, I believe with all my heart that committed people who are living and acting like your church, if we are being the church, this and every community we touch will be transformed in the name of Jesus. This is not about growing one body. This is not about growing Life Church in Humansville alone. This is about populating the kingdom of God with people who are turning their lives over to you becoming part of your body. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And if you agree with me, say amen. amen. High five somebody standing next to you. <laughs> Pastor Carl, come and do what you do. Amen. Have a seat for just a second. Two, two things that I would... Uh, I would ask you to do, and I'm going to ask you three, but two things first. First, if you were one of those people who raised a hand and said, today I'm making Christ the head of my life. Uh, one of the things that he said is, you know, you, you acknowledge, you, you ask, you believe, and you confess. And so I would encourage you to share your decision to do that with somebody. Somebody that is a believer, somebody that is already a follower of Christ. One, so that they can rejoice with you and celebrate with you, but second, so they can pray for you. Okay, and uh, so that that will that will be important for you. That's kind of the next step for you. Uh, secondly, those of you who have been in the church for a while, um, let me give you a visual, and it goes right along with what Greg was saying. Um, how many of you have washed dishes before by hand, not with a dishwasher, but by hand? Yes, everybody in the room. And what happens when you leave the washcloth in the sink or the sponge, the little scrubber? Well, I had a pastor friend that used to say, it, it sits, soaks, and sours. And listen, that is easily applicable to us as the body of Christ if we don't do, if we don't be the body of Christ. If we just come in here day, uh, Sunday after Sunday and Wednesday night after Wednesday night and we just listen and we take all of the stuff in and it just keeps building and building and building and it's all over us and it's all in us but we don't ever give it out. We sit, we soak, and we sour. And it smells. No, it stinks. It stinks. So don't sit, soak, and sour but go and be the church. Okay? Yes, sir. Isn't kind of the goal of all that to get people that don't go to church to come to church? Absolutely. I mean, you said we could pick somebody from the church that doesn't follow Christ. Mm -hmm. Why not pick somebody that doesn't follow Christ and try to get them to people? Absolutely. Yeah, you're. I mean, you you got her. You hit it right on the top, right on the head of the nail. The, yeah. My 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 point was here. Share share with somebody right away what God has done in your life. So we can encourage and pray with but yeah absolutely i mean when you walk out you know the best person to win somebody to christ is somebody who just met christ because they have just experienced the grace and the mercy and the love and the forgiveness of god fresh you know i mean it's it's all over you when you get something new what do you want to do you want to tell people about it we went to the Chiefs game last night. You all going to hear about the Chiefs for a while because it's football season. Listen, if I would have had the opportunity to get an autographed Chiefs hat with Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey across the middle of it, 
I guarantee you, you would have seen it this morning. <laughs> I would have been showing it off. That's a hat and somebody's signature. Now we have the Savior of the world. But let's bring it home. Let's make it personal. We have the one who died for me and saved me. How much greater um, gift, opportunity to give and to share. Look what God has done in me. I once was a sinner. I once was this. I once was that. I once did this. I once did all of that. And now I'm saved and I'm free. And I have a new start on life. That's pretty exciting. You, you, you're all over, man. Because we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna share with somebody real quick here before we go. And then, man, look, the the waitress at the restaurant after after church that you go to, or, man, those poor, poor gals and guys that work at Walmart. I mean, one in a million you see with a smile on their face, right? I loved it when you said Walmart, man. Ask my wife. We go to Walmart. It drives me nuts if they have their badge turned over where I can't see their name. I mean, I just want to reach out and flip it so I can say, hey, Joe, how you doing? You know? And I talk to them like they're a person because they are and they're important. And you know what? It's building that connection, building that relationship that opens the door for us to say, can I tell you about my Lord? Can I tell you about my Savior? Can I tell you about what Jesus did for me? You know what? I've been through the same thing you're going through. You know how I got through it? This is what God did. And you will be amazed at the opportunities God will give you to do something just as easy as to share what you've already experienced and what you know. Amen? Amen. All right. I want to give you an opportunity to bless Greg and Diane as they've been with us today. So Kirk and, and uh, Brian are going to wait on you for a, a special offering to give to them just as a thank you. They didn't ask for this. Um, it's not a requirement from us. But uh, we believe that the, the ministry that they have shared with us is worth investing in. And so I want to give you that chance to, to be a blessing to them. So uh, let's pray.